This is a review of Just a Patty by Jean Webster, a children's novel from 1911. Webster is most famous for Daddy Longlegs, another children's book that she would write the very next year. Just Patty is the prequel to an earlier novel, When Patty Went to College. I read both books about Patty Wyatt online on Project Gutenberg because they're mostly out of print. I'm not sure why Webster picked a prequel instead of a sequel, but my guess would be that she really liked the form that boarding school can give to a story. This is my fourth novel by her, and the only one that isn't set in a boarding school or college is set in an orphanage, which is basically the same thing. Let's begin with the prose. Just Patty is one of the funniest novels I've ever read. I was literally shaking with laughter when reading the first chapter. It has Patty's and her best friend's reaction to the news that they won't be roommates for their final year at St. Ursula's, but have been assigned to share rooms with other girls whom they don't like. Her friend Priscilla is rooming with a missionary's daughter who doesn't seem to have any sense of humor. Her other friend Connie is with someone who gained 20 pounds over the summer and never stops eating, even in their room. And Patty herself is with Mae Mertel, the sort of girl who thinks she's better than everyone else. Later in the novel, May develops into what I can only anachronistically call a frenemy. When Patty, Priscilla, and Connie complain to their teachers, they're told that they were put with the other girls to help those girls out. That is, to help the missionary's daughter learn how to be more laid back, to help the overweight girl lose a few pounds, and to help May be less conceited. And when they hear it put that way, they become girls with a mission, and they don't want to do it by halves. They decide that they're not just going to reform their roommates, they're also going to reform the entire school. I'm going to quote one passage from that chapter to give you an idea. This is from an impromptu faculty meeting, during which the teachers discuss the effects of having the most mischievous girls in school heading a moral reform. One of the teachers is describing Priscilla's efforts with the missionary's daughter, Karen. I found Priscilla deliberately stirring up the contents of Karen's bureau drawers with a shinny stick. And when I asked her what she was doing, she replied without the least embarrassment that she was trying to teach Karen to be less exact. But the thing that really troubled me the most is a matter almost a blasphemy. Karen has a very religious turn of mind, but an unfortunate habit of saying her prayers out loud. One night, after a peculiarly trying day, she prayed that Priscilla might be forgiven for being so aggravating. Whereupon Priscilla knelt before her bed and prayed that Karen might become less self-righteous and stubborn and more ready to join in the sports of her playmates with generosity and openness of spirit. They carried on, well, really, one might almost call it a praying match. Okay, there are lots of other fun episodes in the novel, but on the other hand, there are some storylines that are really cliched, like meeting a really wealthy person but not recognizing him, telling him what you really think of him, and impressing him with your frankness. Because if he's a really wealthy person, he probably never hears an unvarnished opinion about himself. Which brings me to the cons. The weakest part of the book is that we don't get a real sense of the characters. Patty has two best friends, Priscilla and Connie, and they're completely interchangeable. The minor characters had more thought put into them, but with the exception of Patty's nemesis, May, they remain totally two-dimensional. When I was reading, I couldn't help comparing Webster's characters to Louisa May Alcott's characters. If you read the first few chapters of Little Women or Little Men, then get a later chapter with all the names blacked out, you'd still know who was talking or who was pulling some crazy stunt. Alcott's characters come off the page. Unfortunately, Webster's characters don't, not even Patty herself. I've read two books in which she is the main character and I still haven't really felt as if I've met her. I feel as if I've met someone else from St. Ursula's who is sharing her memories of Patty, but not Patty herself. This is both sad and odd because Webster clearly had a very satirical eye for character. 
If she had done better in this area, Just Patty may have been more of a girl's classic. Maybe not as popular and enduring as Little Women, but definitely on the level of What Katie Did at School by Susan Coolidge. I read Just Patty for a personal reading project in which I check out the less famous books of dead authors. The question I ask myself is whether those books being forgotten is an oversight on our part or a fair reflection of their middling quality. With respect to Just Patty, I'm afraid that it's just not that good, for reasons I've already mentioned. There are also lots of what you might call pop culture references in the story that a modern reader or even a reader from a few decades after its publication might not really understand. For example, when Patty describes snobby May, she says that May always crosses on the white star line. Now, what in the world is the white star line? Thanks to the internet, I was able to learn that it was a shipping company, and from the context clues in the novel, I guessed that it was the company you'd choose for travel if you were really rich, like the Lufthansa of the early 20th century. But someone reading in the 1960s or 1970s might not have been able to look up that kind of information so easily. If your children's book requires an annotated edition to be understood by its target readers, then it's probably not worth the trouble. Of course, having said that, I must admit that I have a copy of Daddy Longlegs, which is annotated, and I, I think Daddy Longlegs is still going strong. Finally, I'm really glad that I read Just Patty. It was funny and entertaining, and it got me wishing that I had gone to school at St. Ursula's. It's also a great time capsule of late 19th century, early 20th century New York. If you like that sort of thing, then you should read Chest Patty too. Thank you for listening.